Greetings, everyone. Um, it's really an honor to be um, introducing the next speaker. Um, my name is Jazina. Um, I'm from Land in Our Names, and um, I'll be leaving a session tomorrow. But um, this evening, um, I'm introducing the second time we've had a speaker from Soulfire Farm, and it's a real bit of luck that we get to bookend um, a really gnarly, challenging year in the farming world with um, brilliant uh, minds from Soulfire. So, um, Naima Penniman is the Programme Director at Soulfire Farm and is a multi-dimensional artist, movement builder, healer, grower and educator committed to planetary health and community resilience. As Programme Director, she coordinates the Afro-Indigenous Farming Immersions and workshops uh, to equip hundreds of adults and youth annually with the land-based skills needed to reclaim leadership as farmers and food justice organisers in their communities to heal their relationship with Earth and to imagine bolder futures. She is the co-founder of Wild Seed, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Community Farm and Healing Village, a black and brown led intentional community focused on ecological collaboration, transformative justice and intergenerational responsibility. She's also the co-founder and co-artistic director of Climbing Poetry, an internationally acclaimed performance duet that duo that uses art as a tool for popular education, community activism and personal transformation. Naima is devoted to subverting injustice, igniting imagination and cultivating collaborations that elevate the healing of our earth, ourselves, our communities, lineages and descendants. Wow, what a bio. As Abby from Farmerama said this morning in the RFC briefing, this will be a joy for all the senses and you really need to hear this. Over to you, Naima. Thank you so much for the warm welcome and introduction, Hosina. I'm so honored to be sharing this space with you and to all who are tuning in to listen. I feel it's an immense blessing to have the opportunity to share stories in this time and to be able to collaborate towards healing in collaboration with the earth. And so I feel really honored for the sacred gift of your listening. And um, yeah, I will be combining some storytelling about our work here in Soul Fire Farm on Mohican territory in New York, um, as well as other black and indigenous led land and food sovereignty projects. And I'll be weaving in some, some poetry and some images to um, help to carry this, this story of you know, how we, in times of multiple pandemics, um, of um, climate catastrophe, of coronavirus, of state violence, um, to be able to really work in right relationship with the land, to be able to build more resilience for our communities. Um, so Vince, I'll ask you to pull up my, um, to, to bring my next slide. And next, before we get started, it's important to pay homage to our ancestors and give thanks to those who made it possible for us to be here. Um, we know we did not get here alone. And so I wanna invite us all to really invite in the energy of our ancestors who continue to stand and root for us. And I wanna call in um, two ancestors in particular. And we can go to the next slide. I wanna call in my grandma's grandma's grandma, whose name was Susie Boyd. And like so many women in the 16 and 1700s in the Dahomey region of West Africa, she was faced with a near certain kidnapping of the transatlantic slave trade. And in the face of immense terror, immense uncertainty. She and others in her community had the courage to gather up seeds they had been saving for generations and to braid those seeds into their hair, believing in the possibility against odds of a future of tilling and reaping on land and believing that we, their descendants, would exist to inherit that seed. And I call upon this story 
Um, because in this time of great uncertainty where we can't see the future before us and we can go to the next slide, this, um, to me, this act of audacity, this act of hope is exactly what we need to be able to imagine um, the futures that we can't see right now. Next. This is a painting I created to depict this story of our ancestral grandmothers braiding seeds into their hair before boarding transatlantic slave ships. And in this moment, I want to invite you to think of an ancestor who had foresight for you and to out loud call their names. Ashe, thank you. Next. So I also want to pay homage and give thanks to the original peoples of the lands upon which I am right now. This is Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican territory and Haudenosaunee territory. And many of the first peoples of this land were forcibly removed in the 1800s to a small reservation in Northern Wisconsin. And um, not just saying their names as an empty acknowledgement, but really as a pledge of ongoing solidarity with the Mohican people. We have a relationship with the Mohican tribe on their terms, which includes a seed exchange, a cultural respect easement, and voluntary taxation. And I welcome all of us to enter into relationships of solidarity with the people on whose land we stand. Next. And the third thank you that I want to give before we embark on our storytelling is to our incredible team at Soulfire. Um, we can often get caught up in individualism. And so it's so important to me that we remember that we're part of collectives and ecosystems and no one gets anywhere by ourselves um, here because of my teammates, um, Kiani and Larissa and Leah and Jonah and Cheryl and so many others. So I give thanks to my team and to your teams as well. Next. And before we go any farther, I want to offer you the first of three poems that I'll be sharing with you throughout this hour. And this is a poem I'm drumming up to tell some of the history of our relationship to land and food in this country, what we know as the United States. And um, often I spend quite a bit of time outlining um, the history of, you know, land theft and erasure, genocide of indigenous people and slavery, sharecropping, convict leasing, and how that has really built the bedrock of what we've inherited in terms of a broken food system that we exist in today. And instead of spending too much time on that history, because I really want to take us up to this present moment, but understanding that to understand this moment, we really under need to understand where we've come from. I want to offer this poem that I conjured in the voice of the soil. What would the soil have to say about the, you know, the history and the legacy of, um, of our experience on land? And so I'm noticing that my my video cut out. So I'm just gonna try to refresh that right quick so that you all can um, see my face as I, as I share these words with you. And I'm hoping you can see me. Um, and we don't even need to see the slides necessarily in this point if it's easy to have me full screen. I'm not sure if, if y'all can see me or not. Okay, great, thank you. So this is black gold in the voice of the soil. I am evidence of love under fingernails, kneecaps stained from kneeling to pray, sacred remains of yesterday, fertile with future. I am musk after rain, soft, firm, unconditional embrace, bosom of returning. I am the earthen floor, slapped with soles of feet, origin story and sorcery. I am vast and cosmic compost, sand, silt, stone, composition of decomposed bones and primordial ferns reborn. 
I am sun turned to rot, particles of stardust heaped in terracotta pots, this thing the living clings to, nascent seedling ancient tree, this melanin rich thickness dripping mineral and mystery. I am galactic blackness, hummus of fecundity. I am mud clung to cassava root in the lower holds of slave ships. The shop, the soggy clay, I raised up sugar cane, fed cotton profits of enslavement. I am arid tears, damp with tears of dislocation. Earth snatched from Japanese farmers, grasped us into concentration. I am gang raped by colonization, who changed his name to capitalism but retains the same enslavement, the erasure and breakage of all my relations for global market chocolate whose growers face starvation. I and the sweet smell of freedom. I am promised past plantation, the ground under Harriet's railroad, the cracks in pavement post-migration. I spawn the roots that push through shoots that subverted subjugation. I am loam, lush with nitrogen in Dr. Carver's legume fields. I am the calcium in the Black Panther's free breakfast meals. I am the cooperative acres Fannie Lou Hamer made real, the once toxic Lots, Hattie Carthen's garden plots, heels. I am ashes of burned Monsanto seed stamped under the feet of Haitian revolutionaries. I am red hot with tomatoes from Taco Bell boycotts, fertilized with the fruit Immokalee farmers left to rot. I am proof of life after death. I am dawning from decay, mass graves in my belly, my open palm spawn gardens. I am transmuter of toxins, cauldron of embryos, cradle of coffins, atmospheric alchemists sequestering carbon. I am dust, bleached, stripped, strained by purveyors of pipelines and mountaintop explosions, erosions of homelands dissolved to oceans, borderlands encroaching, I am choking. I am swept up and stepped upon, guzzled by the gluttonous, I am paradise paved over, poison drenched, drained of sustenance, I buttress monocultures of monopolies to feed cultures of injustices. I am cultivated by machete, I am defended by cutlass, silent utterance, I am thunderous. I am umber, ochre, saffron, sienna, crimson, cinnamon, cocoa, brown, and ebony. I am gold, gold, gold. You are soiled, filthy, black, dirt, rich. You are soul, soul, soul. Take me in your palm. Breathe in my memory, remember me, fall soft where you belong, my seed, I need you. The future depends on me. Thank you. I'll take a deep breath and we can go back to the slides. And I invite the energy of the land, the soil that has witnessed generations and generations um, of our migrations, our displacement, our homemaking, our cultivation, and, and our resilience and our renewal um, to help to bear witness to this journey and to help to compost um, trauma in relationship to land, as well as to provide the fertility for the dreams that each of us are carrying. Mm -hmm. So I hope my metaphors helped us lay a bedrock of some of the foundation of the US food system. You know, stolen land and exploited labor have really become the DNA, the blueprint of the US food system and that has not fundamentally changed. So wherever you look, whether that's land, labor, ecology, capital, um, we, we see this um, ongoing prevalence of a basis of the labor that produces our food um, not having dignity as well as um, the land itself. So it leads us to where we are today, um, complicity in a system where 
85% of the food that gets to our plates is being grown by folks who have come from overseas and who do not have labor protections. It leads us to where we are today, where agriculture and then um, the way our food is being grown is a number one driver of climate change, of water withdrawals and land mass extraction. I'm sorry, next. Um, and it leads us to where we are today, where we are living in a time where some people experience food op opulence and a, a tremendous amount of options of food and other people are living amidst food scarcity. Um, and we call that food apartheid. You know, our government officially terms certain neighborhoods as food deserts, which um, we say deserts are a natural phenomenon in a system where, um, you know, one in eight Black children are going to bed hungry. There's not a natural system. That's not a natural ecosystem, but rather a system of apartheid. Next. And in this year, we see an increasing amount of attacks on our breath from the choking of wildfires to the choking of COVID to the choking of police brutality. Um, that has intensified the pre-existing um, violence against the land and against those who are closest to the land and against our BIPOC communities. Next. So no one should go to bed hungry. We should all have the right to eat. And it's a disgrace to me that we are experiencing an extreme amount of hunger across the globe and the US is no exception. And it is very much around race lines here in the US. And so the I, there's an irony to me that the people who would grow our food, you know, should have access to the food that they need, but the migrant community is some of the most food insecure in our nation with one half to two thirds of migrant households not having enough food to eat. And our black, indigenous and Latinx communities being three times more likely to experience um, lack of food and to go hungry. And with it also the diet related um, illnesses of heart disease and diabetes and also many mental illnesses that come along with not having access to fresh, healthy food. Next. And as I mentioned, 85% of the food grown in our country today is by the hands of those who are born outside of the United States who are Spanish speaking seasonal employees. And this is very much in response to filling a labor vacuum of an agricultural system that has been dependent on um, forced labor from the unpaid labor of slavery to the unpaid labor of share of convict leasing and the um, debt peonage system of sharecropping, you know, in the, in the aftermath of those systems, we turn overseas to say, who could we exploit next? And starting with the Bracero program and H2, H2A programs um, have been recruiting workers um, to take part in a system where there is no legal minimum wage, um, there are no um, rights to overtime or collective bargaining, and folks are living in extremely challenging living conditions, uh, forced to work the fields. Next. And while there are many Spanish speaking workers growing the food, next, there are very little pathways to leadership and management. So you can see the percentage of farm workers who identify as Latino being 80%, yet only 3% of farm managers and one third of farm workers living below the poverty line. And under COVID, um, it's even more extreme. Our agricultural workers have been deemed essential and you know, forced to continue to work the fields day in and day out harvesting and also working in meat packing plants that have been hot zones for the spread of the virus. Um, but in addition to not having labor protections, also do not have 
lung protection in the face of um, both wildfire smoke and this deadly pandemic and are not receiving the rollout of the, um, of the vaccine. Next. And we also haven't fundamentally addressed the redistribution of land. Um, you know, 98% of the land in this country is held by the descendants of European colonists. So indigenous people have continued to been dispossessed and black folks who have a, had amassed in the peak of black land ownership, 15% is now back to less than 1% after decades of USDA discrimination and racial terror. Next. Mm -hmm. And here you can see the farmland ownership by race, which is more racially skewed than ever before in our nation. Next. Um, and the decline specifically for Black Americans um, from that high point, you know, in the aftermath of the Civil War of like saving up money to have land and have dignity and ownership on land, um, which has steadily declined um, due to documented discrimination of, um, of you know, crop, allot crop allotments and assistance from the government. Um, as well as folks having land stolen from them and also facing racial terror and fleeing to the northern cities. Next. And, and of course, the other piece of this broken food system is that industrial agriculture is driving carbon out of the earth where it belongs and throwing it up into the atmosphere. And within one generation of the European colonization of this country, one generation, 80% um, of the carbon was taken from the soil and thrown up into the atmosphere through intensive plowing, launching anthropogenic climate change. Um, and that only continues. So as I mentioned, um, this system of industrial agriculture that's done with heavy machineries and lots of chemical inputs um, and lots of genetic modification is both harming the people who are growing the food and also harming the land that provides the food. Next. And here you can see some of those environmental impacts of um, water withdrawals, of land use, and of loss of biodiversity. Next. Okay, so thank you all for um, being present through um, some of the conditions that we find ourselves in. And I'm excited and the remainder of my storytelling to be sharing some of the response strategies, some of the solidarity strategies and ways that we've been intervening at Soul Fire Farm as part of a much larger and even global movement of, of folks really working um, to reverse the dangerously low percentage of um, BIPOC folks in leadership in the farm system and also how we farm in a way that um, doesn't trash the planet and also is able to provide um, food for those who need it most in our community. Next. So I'll share a little bit um, more about Soul Fire Farm for those who don't know. So you have a background, um, the, the three kind of pillars of our work. Um, the number one part of our mission is to feed our community and steward the lands. And we use Afro-Indigenous agricultural practices um, to regenerate 80 acres of land here in Grafton, New York. And, you know, through the traditions passed down to us from our ancestors of no-till, of cover cropping, of rotational grazing, of diversified polyculture and many more. Um, we're able to increase biodiversity on our land. We're able to build topsoil to restore pre-colonial ca carbon levels on our soil and also to produce an abundance of food. We grow um, vegetables and fruits and we have um, poultry and other livestock as well as medicinal herbs and mushrooms um, that we're able to make available to our community on a sliding scale basis through direct doorstep, doorstep delivery. Next. And the second part of our mission is to pass on this knowledge to others. So we're a community training farm and 
thousands of people come here to Soulfire every year to live and learn with us. We have a week long program that is a farming immersion that we do six times a year. And people come and have the experience of of learning these Afro-Indigenous agricultural practices. And we're also really working to heal our relationship to land because of the land-based trauma that exists in our lineages. And this program is centered around Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And our graduates go on to do incredible work in the food system and starting their own land-based projects. And so we're really, really proud of our super strong alumni network. And in addition to the week-long trainings that we do, we have uprooting racism trainings and youth programs and rites of passage programs um, and skill shares on different farming techniques from agroforestry to seed saving um, so that we can continue to learn and strengthen together with these survival skills. Next. And the third pillar of our mission is to build the movement for food and land sovereignty, right? We're not an island and we're so honored to be part of a huge network of folks, including the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, including the Heal Food Alliance, including Via Campesina, and more and more that I could name. Um, but we're working together to change policy, you know, like the um, fair work for, um, for justice for farm workers and fair working conditions, um, to change policy and around land access for Black farmers. We're working on reparations campaigns and institutional purchasing campaigns. And we're also really excited to share that we um, helped to launch and incubate a cooperative of um, farmers and land stewards in the Northeast of Black and Indigenous heritage um, to form a community land trust to facilitate in the transfer of land um, back to our communities. And so that's been an exciting regional project that we've been up to here. And I feel like we're taking our cues from nature and modeling a mycelial network of support. We're exchanging resources and ideas and nutrients so that we can grow strong together. Next. And ultimately, it all comes back to every one of us getting to be fully alive. And we know that that aliveness is intrinsically connected to having access to good food and good land, the environments that we're in. And, um, you know, I, I'm working for a world where all of us have access to those very essential ingredients to our thriving and to our, our healthy lifestyles. Next. And, we know that in this time of multiple pandemics that the veil has really been lifted, right? And the pre-existing disparities and struggles that our communities have been up against have only intensified. And so this year has really pushed us to just step even stronger into our commitments and because of our mission, you know, already being like poised and on track to do this, but I want to share some of the ways that we've been able to respond in collaboration with our community um, to meet the increasing needs of this time, you know, and, and I know all of us in different ways are, you know, really figuring out what mutual aid looks like and what, you know, interdependence looks like in a time where we're struggling both with, um, you know, in some ways increased isolation and also increased need to look out and take care of one another. And so solidarity sharing the harvest is, is one of our response strategies. And we've been running a sliding scale, um, um, we, call it, uh, we call it our Ujima program, which is like cooperative um, responsibility. And, um, but it's like a CSA that instead of um, coming to the farm to pick up your share, we provide direct doorstep delivery from our farm to our members. Next, sorry, next slide. And so the food that we grow um, has always been at the service of our community and trying to make it as affordable as possible. But in light of the COVID pandemic, we decided to give away like 100% of the food that we're growing at no cost. Next. So 
that has meant, um, let's see, our, our CSA this year was, I want to say 32 weeks of um, packing up big boxes and bushels of food next. And um, this is the white van that we make our deliveries in. That's my nephew Emmett. But we go from um, from doorstep to doorstep dropping off the food so that transportation is never, never a barrier to those in our community who need to have access to this life-giving food. Um, so every Thursday we make the route and we deliver the food fresh from our farm and including um, eggs and including um, a value add product. Like we did jams and pestos and sauces and breads this year in addition to the whole foods of the fruit and the vegetables. Next. Um, these are more images of the harvest days and you know the growing Growing food the way that we do with no chemical inputs without the use of tractors or tillage means a lot means a lot of you know labor by hand um, and it's a it's a labor of love to be very close to the earth and the process of harvesting this food that we know is imbued with the energy of the care that we give the plants all season. Next, and I'll just read this quote from one of our Ujama Farm Share members. He says. I have loved the fresh food that I've been blessed to enjoy since joining the CSA. I've seen a complete change in my mood and general outlook. This, I believe, is tied to relieve stress from not having money for good produce and also, also the healthier feeling that comes with farm to table food. Next. <laughs> and that's just an image, image of one of our harvest feasts pre COVID. <laughs> Next. So it's one thing, right, to taste some, um, sorry, to give someone a fish, right? I think the, the adage goes, you give a man a fish, he eats for a day, you teach him how to fish, he'll eat forever, right? So thinking of this, um, we also challenge ourselves to not only provide the emergency food assistance to those who need it most, but also to be thinking of how we build increased community controlled food sovereignty um, by teaching more people in our community to grow food. And so we have a program called Soul Fire in the City. It's all about supporting folks and having their own home gardens. And so we can go to the next slide. Um, in past seasons, we would, you know, help out maybe four neighbors in establishing their gardens. But this year, because of the pandemic and the increased realization of this need to reclaim our food sovereignty in a time of immense food insecurity. Um, we we um, did over 40 gardens this year. We can advance through these slides, these next few slides, like maybe give it five seconds a slide. <laughs> um, and you can um, see some of our teammates and also volunteers. We had 20 volunteers help us for this massive effort to establish these 40 home gardens. And our Soul Fire in the City program really centers folks who are impacted by food apartheid or who are low income or survivors of mass incarceration, also refugees and new immigrants, as well as families with children and folks with disabilities or chronic illness. And in order to do that, to like enable the participation of our elders, for example, it really required community collaboration. Um, so we were able to provide the lumber and the soil and the compost, the seeds, the seedlings um, to be able to establish these gardens as well as the labor, all of that support to get them started. And we helped with crop planning and um, the layout of the garden, um, as well as ongoing guidance to support our gardeners throughout the season. And the guidance is a really important piece. Like it was important for us to pull together resources and information to help um, to teach new gardeners how to grow food and to provide mentorship to check back in throughout the season to help people if they were having problems with pests or had questions about what was a weed and what wasn't and through that really building community. 
And we can keep advancing through the slides. I'm not sure if it's just stuck on my end. Um, just that you can see some of the images of the gardens we were able to create. And it was great to mobilize around this, um, the town of Troy, like donated compost and um, Hawthorne Valley donated seeds. And, you know, we had seedlings growing in our greenhouse as well as other greenhouses um, to be able to supply enough for the entire program. And we got a few more slides of so far in the city. And it was 90% of folks that received a garden said they, you know, really got a good harvest out of their garden, which is great. Um, and everybody said it was a very satisfying um, program to be part of, like to build community through the gardens, as well as, um, you know, having a chance to receive the nourishment. You know, it's also like the act of caring for something in a time of a lot of uncertainty to be able to tend to the soil. And I'll just end with this quote from um, the folks who are pictured here, um, who are two moms raising two beautiful children in Albany. And they said, growing our food during this time connects us to the earth in a way that truly feeds our souls. In this time when we feel such a lack of control and we are overwhelmed by an avalanche of daily pressures and uncertainty, we are blessed by the opportunity to slow our breath, kneel down and watch for signs of life in the dirt. Each leaf, brings hope and promise. Each blossom whispers that the earth is our first mother. The garden is a true gift to our mental health. I hope it marks the beginning of a lifetime of connection to source for my children. Mm. Shout out to Megan who wrote that. Next slide. And Soulfire is not alone in this. Um, so inspired by our comrades in Buffalo who learned about the Soul Fire in the City program and said, we need to do this in Buffalo. And so we shared our model and some tips with them and they just went with it and um, were able to establish over 20 gardens in Buffalo, New York. Um, uh, and we stayed in touch to hear each other's challenges and successes um, you know, from city to city. And so big shout out to the Freedom Gardeners of Buffalo. Next. And I also want to uplift Darren Chavez, who started a similar project in Richmond, Virginia, called Resiliency Gardens. And similar to Soul Fire in the City, you know, being able to provide the tools and soil and seeds and supplies to support folks in building gardens throughout the city of Richmond. And um, we drew inspiration and support from each other in our respective cities to make it happen. Next. And one more shout out for now. This is Jermaine Jenkins of Fresh Future Farm in South Carolina. Um, Jermaine was relying on food stamps, like an emergency food pantries to feed her children. And then said, you know what? I'm tired of waiting in line. I need to learn how to grow food to take care of my family and learn how to grow food in her backyard and then started teaching other neighbors how to grow food. And that eventually turned into them acquiring a less than one acre lot um, in their neighborhood to start Fresh Future Farms that now has a farm stand on site and they're able to distribute fresh food to an area that has no grocery store in sight. So shout out to Jermaine for that incredible leadership. Next. I wonder if anybody recognizes the person in the in the center photo. And if you want to put it in the chat, if you have a guess, feel free. I'll give a beat before revealing. This is Eric Garner, uh, beloved ancestor, rest in peace. And um, Eric Garner tragically was killed at the hands of police officers. And his crime was 
selling untapped cigarettes in front of a cor corner store. And for that, he was choked to death. His last words have become a famous rallying cry. I can't breathe, were his last words. And I wanted to honor Eric Garner's life by sharing these photos, you know, that are less known. You know, we, we know more about his death often than his life. And I'll share this poem that a friend wrote um, that shares a little bit more about his life too. And we can go to the next slide so you can read it along with me. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants, which most likely some of them in all likelihood continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. And with that, let's take three deep breaths together. Thank you. Next. So I know that so many of you all who are tuning in and listening right now are part of um, some efforts to support our communities and being able to breathe deeper and to also support the balance of breath in our ecosystem, right? Of, of the sacred reciprocity of oxygen and carbon dioxide, which has gone out of balance. And this is a time for all of us to take part in restoring balance to our world in so many ways through, um, through our practices of you know, redistribution of resources through being stewards of the land, um, through helping to, um, to be able to allow dignity for, you know, those who have been exploited for generations. And so I want to presence us to the fact that we're not alone, like each of us representing a constellation of that important change-making work. Next. And this image is of the Northeast Farmers of Color Network um, that I referenced earlier that's helping to support with land redistribution in our region and starting the community land trust. Next. Um, that first picture is us, of us here on the land at Soul Fire and the other photo is um, one of the first times we were able to convene um, indoors a couple years ago to launch the community land trust. Next. And it's carried on by so many. And I, it's important for me to, to give shout outs so that we know that, um, that we're out here, that the leadership is strong. You know, it looks like the resistance looks like Karen Washington, who started the Black Urban Growers and Farmers Conference and Rise and Root Farm and urban gardening all over the Bronx. It looks like Malik Yakini in Detroit, you know, against odds, building a two acre farm in Detroit to get food to those who need it most. It looks like Dennis Derrick distributing food to those with terminal illness in the Bronx. Um, Black Dirt Farm Collective, grow where you are in Atlanta, farmers to grow in the South. So shout out to, to all of them and to many more. Next. I also want to uplift some of our alumni from our Farming Immersion programs who've gone on to do great work, like the Cato Tumbo Farming Cooperative, um, Love Fed New Haven, People y Alimentos, the Spanish First Project, um, High Hog Farm reclaiming like the fiber industry in the South, Percussion Farms in the Northwest, Miracle on Craig Street in Albany. Mm -hmm. Take notes, these people are amazing if you need a dose of inspiration. <laughs> Next slide. And I wanna uplift um, some other grassroots leaders in the work who are all either black or indigenous or other people of color led projects doing really great work here. Um, the land loss 
Prevention Project, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, SAFON, which stands for the Southeast African American Organic Farmers Network, Tata, Via Campesina, Fresh Future Farms, Black Urban Growers, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, Black Farmer Fund of New York, um, Black Church Food Security Network, Heal Food Alliance, and the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. And feel free to share in the chat other examples of BIPOC led leaders in food and land sovereignty work so that we can make sure to uplift and support them as well. Next. Uh, so far, we put together a action platform um, that we invite you to check out. It's the result of hundreds of conversations with farm workers and farmers and um, you know leaders in the field about you know what what needs to be done and what would justice look like. And it's divided into um, multiple sections, so you can intervene on many levels, whether it's policy, whether it's um, institutional purchasing power, whether um, it's like kind of more personal and individual steps that you can take. That's a very comprehensive and multi-page document designed for anybody who's ever asked, what can I do to help heal a broken food system? Um, so I invite you to check that out, soulfirefarm.org, um, take action. And we'll go to the next slide. Okay, and next you can see the stay connected for all of y'all that want to continue to build. You can go next to the next slide. Um, just as we start to wind down, we're not quite done yet, um, but I do want to you know, really extend the invitation for us to continue to stay in conversation um, throughout these times where we need each other more than ever. So at this time, I'm going to share. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to unmute. <laughs> I'm going to share a closing poem with you, and then we'll have a time for some question and answers. So thank you all again for the sacred gift of your attention um, and the storytelling I'm sharing with you today. And I'm honored to share one more poem that I wrote, and it's really dedicated to, to all of us who are um, doing that work of of growing food wherever we can, and also to saving the seeds um, for, for the future. Every patch of earth unencumbered by concrete where soil and atmosphere meet is a portal to presence, a terrain of remembrance, a vote for survival and an unpromised future. These gardens are blueprints of interdependent destiny, intergenerational memory, saving seeds for food as remedy. See, my people know what it's like to eat and still be starving. So we turn in hardship into harvest, lawns and schoolyards into gardens, homegrown bounty in our palms. We come from soil and stardust, and so we conjure. Giving props to hood magicians who grow provisions for our kitchens, we smuggle spinach into prisons, transform the places that we live in. Trade psychosis for symbiosis and stay focused. We sprout sunflowers that towel on neighborhood blocks, harvest raindrops on rooftops to water our crops, propagate plant medicine for the metropolis guarding our plots because our gardens are not for profit or loss. Cross-pollinate the promise, fam. We got this. Take a deep breath. Restore calmness. With lemon balm, bounty in our palms, hot peppers in our pockets, black eyed peas spiraling up Lenape blue corn stalks with buttercup squash carpets, three sisters symbiotic, talking stories of solidarity on native territory. Migratory monarchs transcend borders, morning glories ascend fences, pay attention to the lessons mother nature keeps expressing how to multiply our blessings for justice and sustenance amid glaring disparity. Every seed saved will set us free. In an age of opulence and scarcity, every seed saved will set us free. 
in a time of intensifying violence and climate calamity, every sea sage will set us free. Hold on tight to the source. We have all that we need. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening and being present with me. And I'm excited to use our last 10 minutes to hear questions from you all. Thank you so much, Naima. Um, it's really fantastic to hear about Soul Fire Farm um, and their most recent experiences um, and the new farms and gardens that uh, people who are in admiration and inspired by you have um, gone on to make. Um, I'm also an alum and um, it was a very formative experience. Uh, I visited when you went there, sadly. Um, I'm going to ask a quick question about um, how it's been during, um, I guess, the latest cycle of BLM activism and um, how people might have had increased asks for what they can do. And there's a couple of questions in the chat about um, what people can do and um, how to keep it as radical as possible. Um, in terms of transformative justice and abolitionist politics, but in the farming world and communicating that to people. Ah, and your internet's a bit shaky, but I know that you're still there. Oh, good. You can still hear me? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate the, the feedback and the affirmation. And I'm, I'm so glad that your feet kissed this ground here. Cosina, that means everything. Um, and yes, what a year we have had and, you know, just tremendous collective building of collective power and uprising in response to like, just ongoing insane violence against our communities. And yeah, I've been, I've been really grateful to see the response of our communities mobilizing and coming together more and, 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 you know, a trend of like more like looking to Black leadership for you know solving um, or addressing the problems of of racism, and so I want to I want to share. Um, I'm actually gonna pull it up now so I can I can put it in the chat. But a whole resource list that we created um, with su with suggestions for actions for folks um, because it's more than I can say very quickly. I mean I'll sh I'll share some highlights, but I'm just gonna pull up this link. Um, well, I mean, if people have got the link, then they can go away and uh, investigate. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do feel like, you know, the, the what is being required of us is to really work on multiple levels, right? Like some of us need to be putting pressure on elected officials for policy change. Some of us need to be doing the work of alternative institution building. Some of us that, you know, we're able to put our bodies on the line in direct action um, and, you know, for some of us, it's really around like the education and the media making and the consciousness raising. And for others of us, it's it's around like the direct service work of like, you know, how do, how do we address like the immediate wounds that we're experiencing? Um, for some of us, it's about reparations and the redistribution of wealth. Um, and I think the solutions are as diverse as kind of like where we're, where we're situated and, and what we have access to to be able to contribute to. Um, to healing on multiple levels. Um, but I do, I do really, you know, call on all of us to be able to channel our grief as well as our magic, you know, our rage and our hope into meaningful action. And I'll share this kind of compilations of, of opportunities to get engaged um, so that y'all can check that out as soon as I pull up. Thank you so much. Can we get your camera back on? Cause I really miss seeing your face right now. Um, another question that's in that thread, um, are you aware of the timeline for the ratification of the Justice for Black Farmers Act? This would be a landslide achievement towards food sovereignty for black farmers in the USA. Okay, thank you. Can you see me now? Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Yes, the Justice for Black Farmers Act, um, yeah, it's a landslide 
if it gets passed. I'm not sure of the timeline, so I don't feel confident to speak to that. Um, yeah, and I apologize, I don't have the answer to that question, but was the you know the results this legislation you know involved the input of many legacy black farmers in the south um, as well as new farmers and um, also consultation with indigenous tribes around land redistribution and and I feel you know very hopeful inspired by what's included in that I'm most familiar with the parts that my sister Leah helped to contribute to um, which include like farmer training. Um, I think it's a really brilliant strategy because so many of our black farmers are, are aging out and passing away and, and then they're mm -hmm. legacies. And so we're, we have this phenomenon where like acres of the South of that, that are being held on by the, like the unfortunately few black farmers that are, have been able to survive um, making a living on land and are getting too, too mm -hmm. tired and too elderly to be able to continue that part of the of the act creates a program where these farmers can pass on their knowledge to new aspiring black farmers, um, as well as in some cases, this land linking of being able to pass on land to, to stay in the stewardship of, of the black community, um, which I think is really, you know, really important and in a time sensitive um, way to respond to this phenomenon that we're seeing play out. So um, that's just one highlight, one personal highlight for me of the act. Fingers crossed it keeps keeps succeeding. Um, a question from the wonderful D. Um, we are the displaced and the dispossessed second, third, fourth generation BPOC. We do not have the legacy of land and farming here in England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Europe. What can we learn from the US struggle uh, in our own struggle to access land and make farming more diverse and equitable? I'm so sorry, Hosein. I, I lost you just at the at the very end. Can you say the the question part? Um, what can we learn from the U.S. struggle in our own struggle to access land and make farming more diverse and equitable? Mm, thank you. Yeah, great question, and much love and solidarity to to you all across the waters. Um, yeah, I would say some lessons that that may be relevant. Um, you know, into like you know, cross cross our circumstance would be um, the fact that the you know the way that land has been dis been distributed and needs to be redistributed. I feel like there are so, there are some parallels, and that it has been inspiring for me to see in the last, especially like even just five years, the voluntary transfer of land from folks who have inherited property through their families based on legacies of like exploitation or just straight up land theft. You know, like the the theft of land from indigenous people or the amassing of wealth based on unpaid labor. Um and and you know descendants of of families of inherited wealth and property saying like I recognize that this isn't rightfully mine and making a choice to redistribute that land to BIPOC communities. Um, so while, you know, like we're waiting to pass policy on a national level around reparations, but in the meantime, I think there's really important work to do on a relational level that may be, that may apply um, also there. And, and then also in terms of like the, the learning, I feel like it's, well, unfortunately, so many of us have, have been you know, uprooted from land or have lost in intimate connection with land. So even before we're in re in like a direct relationship of stewardship to land, like as many opportunities as we, as we can find to, um, to learn from those who, you know, have the practices um, of, of taking care of land and being taken care of by land. It's like, we need that information. So through like as much as we can in person, you know, and like, gleaning the wisdom of our elders, also learning directly from the land herself, who has so many lessons for us, as well as gobbling up as much resources as, as we can, I think is just like a really important step in that journey of, of reclamation of a dignified relationship to land. So that by the time we get it, <laughs> like, you know, we, we really um, are coming like full, full of as much knowledge as possible from that, from that real thirst to be in right relationship with her.
Thank you so much, Noma. Yeah, we got our work cut out and the movement's yeah. in its infancy, but you know, we're learning a lot from you. Um, there's been a couple of questions about um, the poem, if you can share the words or are you reading it? Um, I probably should have asked that question first, but if, if there's a link to it on the Soul Fire Farm website. Yeah, well, the, um, the first poem that I read, Black Gold, is on Soul Fire Farm's YouTube. So it's called Black Gold and it should be pretty easily searchable. Um, the last one that I did is not yet on YouTube, um, but but I, I did record, I did do a nice recording of it. Um, it's just like a kind of preview type thing. But if you if you subscribe to Soul Fire's YouTube channel, it's gonna go up on, on like by the spring. So you'll be able to have it that way. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant. Um, I don't know if you wanted to come back Excuse on the camera. Bye. I'm sorry. I, uh, the other session is waiting for the interpreters from this session. So okay. we do need, do need to end. Um, Wave bye-bye then. Right now. Thank okay. you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. And thank you so much for the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for the tech support. Thank you for the interpretation. Thank you for the moderation. And yeah, we're in this together, y'all. Let's keep it connected. Much better. Definitely. Have a great one. Bye. Thank you.